All of this that Jesus is speaking about pertains to Israel. So take note of that. It pertains to Israel. It pertains to the Jewish people. It pertains to God's people. At this point in time, remember, guys, that the people of Israel had already been far removed from their land. Um, the northern kingdom was taken captive in 722 B.C. The southern kingdom was taken captive at 536, uh, 86 B.C. The temple was dis, uh, destroyed by the Babylonian Empire. And we see that, that the southern and northern kingdoms were totally taken out of the land. And, and since the time in which the people of Israel have been making their way back into the land and what we've been studying on Sunday mornings, and with the story of Daniel and the people returning back into the land, the people had yet to fully possess the land because Gentile kings and kingdoms, as soon as they took them out, Assyria brought different Gentile kings and kingdoms in. And then, and then when the southern kingdom was taken captive, once again, Babylon, there was Gentile kings and kingdoms over the land of Israel. See, God had promised his people this land. And in the days of Joshua, well, they possessed the land. They possessed the land, and, and then they lost it all. And one of the promises that God had made through the prophet Jeremiah and many other prophets was that, one, the captivity would only be for a period of 70 years, but, but two, God promised that all the people would come back to the land. The scriptures clearly teach through the prophets one of the promises is that Israel will be gathered back into her land. And so something that you and I need to take note of as we kind of work our way through this is that, you know, there are so many things that kind of point to that period of time that we're in. You know, as I shared with you guys before, you can, you can look back and you can see that for a great period of time, Israel has always been, the land of Israel has always been occupied by other nations. Always. It's always been occupied by other people. You go back and you study the history of the land, you'll see that it's gone through various other Gentile kings and, 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 and kingdoms and nations. And even in the time of Christ, the people didn't even possess the land, the people of Israel, because Rome was in power. And so you see that all of this that Jesus was declaring also would be, too, that his emphasis is that when these things do take place, there will still be an Israel. There will still be a Jewish people. And he's reminding them that in those days, he says that they will be, they will be taken, they will be arrested. He's reminding them that in these days, all these things are going to take place. And so, in a sense, Jesus is kind of assuring the disciples and the Jews in his day that Israel will continue to remain and exist. And that's kind of like what we read about in the book of uh, Romans in chapter 11, where the Bible says all the gifts of God are irrevocable. They're, they're without repentance, meaning that what God promised Israel, uh, it, it's going to remain. God will continue to do that and, and fulfill his promise and keep his promises. And so this is why we've always said, you know, to kind of keep our eyes on Israel. And so if you guys remember some years back, um, a dear friend of mine, uh, Don Stewart, he's taught here quite a few times. You guys know he's a friend of this fellowship, a dear friend of mine. And he always has like this, this system that he says to watch out for. He says, look, look for these things. When you see these things taking place, because he says, these are the things that have to take place before the second coming of Jesus. And he kind of gave a list. Some of you know it. You've read his books and that, that he's written. But I just want to reiterate some of the things. In all the years that he studied, these are some of the things that he said. And in no way is he trying to set dates. He's just saying, this is what the scriptures reveal. And he says there's 14 things that we can say, you know, what are the 14 signs that we are near the end. And the first one is that the Jews have returned to their ancient homeland. The Jews have returned to their ancient homeland. And remember that it wasn't up until probably about 2010, we had more Jews in the United States than the land of Israel. We had more Jews here in this country than Israel. Now the tide has changed. There are more Jews in Israel than there are on any part of the world. The Jews have clearly continuing to go back into their land, continuing to regather and get back in there. And, and this is the thing that I think is so, is so amazing that we're seeing this. In 1948, when Israel became a nation, remember that you know, there, was, there was great opposition. Israel has always had opposition. 
And for years, you would think, why is there so much turmoil? Because since the Jews have been gathering back into their land, they've been saying, this land is ours. Because this is what the Torah, this is what their scriptures tell them, that God had promised the land to Abraham. And he said, your descendants, this is, this is theirs. You see what I'm saying? But remember, they were taken out of their land by two prominent empires. And since they've been coming back, so many other Gentile nations and, 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 and uh, Islam and, and all these other people have, have ravaged their land and have, and have said, no, this is our land. So this is where the big issue is back and forth. So today, the Arab world, uh, the Palestinians say that the land is theirs. And what they say is they say, well, it was promised to us too. Because remember that the Jews, they're descendants of Isaac. But the Arabs, the Palestinians, they're descendants of Ishmael. Both are sons of Abraham. But remember that God said the promise would be through Isaac. Remember that that's who the promise was through and that the Lord said, I will make a great nation out of your descendants. And that was through this child that Sarah would have with Abraham. But then you look back and then you see that Abraham and Sarah kind of got a little bit ahead before the Lord. It took about 25 years for that word to be fulfilled in that. But God spoke his word, but they stepped ahead of the Lord. And then Sarah came up with this idea and said, Abraham, will go into my maidservant, Hagar, go into her. And because she was Sarah's maidservant, clearly Sarah owned her. And any children that Hagar would have had would have been Sarah's and Abraham's. So she says, go into her and have a child through her. And so Abraham didn't protest. He did it and was an obedient husband to his wife, <laughs> did what she asked. And, and he did. But the Bible says that that is where the problem began from that point on. And then you get into the book of Galatians, and it talks about the free woman and the bond woman, and Hagar represents the bond woman, and then the, the free woman is who the promise is through, Sarah. And so you see that then throughout the years, the descendants of Ishmael have always been a thorn in the flesh to the descendants of Isaac. That is the consequence of their sin. Abraham made a bad judgment, a bad decision, and you can choose your sin, but you can't choose the consequences of your sin. And we see that since the very beginning, the land has been fought over, but God said that the promise was through Isaac. And we see everything throughout Isaac's descendants, the history of God's people have just been, we have it here in the scriptures, but even secular history, history itself reveals all the atrocities done to the people of Israel and them never being recognized as, as you know, the rightful people of the land. And we have things like the Holocaust where you see where there was millions, millions of Jews killed. And, and all of this is a work of the enemy trying to destroy the very promise of God. And then we see the second thing, the Temple Mount will be in the headlines, the continual preparations to build a third temple. And, you know, and so we do see that the issue is over where the Dome of the Rock is today in Israel, and that's eastern Jerusalem. And, you know, when you look at when Israel became a nation in 1948, you know, they had most of Jerusalem. The problem was is that there was already a, you know, good amount of Palestinians, Arabs there, you know, and so they um, would claim, you know, Jerusalem is theirs. And so in 1967, there was a, a war called the Six-Day War. And, and uh, we know that Moshe Dayan, this ruler, this leader, general in the Israeli army, he, he, he captured eastern Jerusalem. Well, it's important. Eastern Jerusalem is where you see that gold dome whenever you take a picture in Israel, have you ever seen that gold dome? That always, they always give you that picture is always taken from the Mount of Olives looking at the city of Jerusalem. So that dome, that's eastern Jerusalem. Well, the Jews captured that, and that's their capital, you see. And, and so, but what happened was Moshe Dayan, this general, if you guys ever, some of you might have, if you go far back, you'll remember in history seeing him on the news. He's the general with the patch on his eye. That's Moshe Dayan. He's the guy that led this, this fight and won. And what he did was he offered that area to the Arabs as a peace gesture, not to give, but to say, hey, look, 
we're not going to fully control it. You guys can stay here, but we have to have access to this because this is the site, bless you, this is the site where we believe our temple was built. You see, and so it started off good, but what ended up happening was with, within a matter of time, the Palestinians turned around and said, you're not allowed up here, you can't come here. So the only place that the Jews go that is a holy site, because the Muslims believe that that golden dome, that's, that's a mosque. There's two mosques actually on that site. And they, to them, that's their holy site. And so the Jews can't go up there and pray because it's, 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 it's the Palestinians, and the, the Muslims, it's their holy site. So you have what is called the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall. And what's so remarkable is that this is where you see the Jews flock and they go and they pray. They offer their daily prayers. Every time we go to Israel, we go to this very place. And, and so one day, the third temple will be built. You see, the first temple was the one that Solomon built. And then you have the second temple that was destroyed 40 years after Jesus said to the disciples that not one stone will be left upon another. 70 A.D. And the third temple, we know there's going to be one because the Bible says in the book of Daniel that there will be a thing called the abomination of desolation. That can only happen in the temple. So we know for sure that there will be a third temple so that the abomination of desolation can take place. And we know that that will take place during the time of the Antichrist. So the center now to focus on would be, wow, when's this third temple going to be built? And there's enough room where the Dome of the Rock is, to put the temple there. But that's, you know, you got to really think about it. You know the Muslims are not going to stand at all for a Jewish temple to be placed on what they say is their property. So it's not theirs. It was just kind of like, you know what, we'll both have access to it. But the second they were able to push the Jews out, they did. And they've had control ever since. The third thing we can see is that nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39 will start to line up. We talked a few Wednesday nights ago about some of these nations. And remember that Russia is one of them, right? And Iran is one of them. And, and remember what we talked about, most notable, Russia and Iran. Well, guess what? The Bible says that they would attack Israel from the north. Well, Syria is on the north. That's where the Golan Heights is. That's, that's where Syria is at. We go today, you could see Syria from the border right there, and, and, and you can see the atrocity and the devastation that has taken place because of war. I mean, we're just, we're just so many yards away from Syria and ISIS and all that that has taken place there. And then you have now Russia in Syria, Iran also in Syria, and you see in the news over and over, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, saying that he will not tolerate a, a, anything from Iran being in Syria. That's too close to him. So I, from what I understand, there's already been three bombings in two days from Israel into Syria as we speak right now. And they're targeting Iranian sites there. And what you guys need to understand about all of this is keep in mind that, that there is a big player in the Middle East. And that big player is Saudi Arabia. And remember, the difference between Iran and Saudi Arabia is you have Sunni and you have Shiites. Shiites are Saudi Arabia, the Sunni are Iranians. And keep in mind that the Shiites, um, you know, most likely, uh, you know, th that's the issue between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And Saudi Arabia is an ally to us. And so far you see some aggression, but don't be surprised if you see Saudi Arabia begin to support Donald Trump's decision because it favors them. And it's just interesting to see all of this stuff that has taken place in these last several days. And today, uh, you know, our country has made history. It's made history. And so... The nations of Ezekiel 38 and 39, they're aligning themselves and it says that they will attack Israel from the north while Russia and Iran are on the northern border of Israel right now as we speak. They're there. 30 years ago, if you would have said this, people would have laughed in your face. They would have told you you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. But here they are and they're there. Then in verse, uh, the fifth thing to look at, it says no superpower in the world. In other words, there'll be a continued decline of American power. There'll be no superpower. In other words, there will be no 
country that is ruling the whole world as it's always been the United States. It's always been the United States being the world power. A lot of these players are coming in. you got China that's becoming a player, and, and they're already there. Europe's becoming a player. Russia's becoming a player. You know what I mean? Uh, you got little small North Korea that's, that's, that's you know, flexing its muscle. And so what that means is that the United States is losing its dominance because other nations are able to gain the same type of world power. You're seeing this in your day. 20 years ago, we were the world power. Nobody would ever in anything try to do anything or, you know, it, it, we were the world power. But the decline began within the last 25 years. We begin to see the decline of this country. And, and all this is a part of God's purpose and plan. Some would say, well, that's the reason why. That's the reason why the United States is not in Bible prophecy. Now, I'm not opposed to that because I hold that view. But my underlining view that I believe that the United States is not in Bible prophecy is because I do believe this. I believe that we are a Christian nation. I believe that uh, it's been the United States, especially in my lifetime, that has presented and proclaimed and preached the gospel and has sent missionaries throughout the entire world. I believe that the reason why perhaps we are not in Bible prophecy is because the church will be raptured and there will not be enough people here to run this country. We're gone. And I believe that's why the United States is not in Bible prophecy. Because we're going to be raptured. And so there'll be no world power. Well, guess what? There are all these nations that all are starting to have the same power. If they all have the same power, there's not one person. So what is it doing? It's setting the stage for a world ruler. You see that? And then we also see the sixth thing. He says, the desperate desire for a world leader, which will be fulfilled by the coming of the Antichrist. Think about that. The exponential increase of technology that will lead to the eventual fulfillment of Revelation 13, the mark of the beast. Do we not see that today, how it's just going? Listen, we know that the mark of the beast is going to be something that's just going to identify the people to this one world order. And how do you do that? I mean, there's so many things that are taking place, so much technology today and, and being able to... To, to see where people are, and it's, it's just mind-blowing how far advanced technology has gone. And, you know, this whole thing with the chip, you know, people got so fixated on the chip, but I, I think it's going to be more complex than that. I think it's going to be, uh, you know, more than just the chip. That might be a part of it, but it's just the system in and of itself. It, it, it's mind-blowing to see, and, and it was some years back, I believe it was Motorola and uh, Discover, they got together, and I don't know how many, you know, billion-dollar agreement to create a chip to, to implant humans with, and today there's whole communities in Europe that are already chipped, and they don't use no credit cards, nothing at all whatsoever. They're, 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 they've, been, they've been like this for the last, I want to say, uh, 15 years and they agreed to do a test run for 20, 25 years. So they're well into it and everything's fine. They're, it's a cashless society. And so it's already being, uh, you know, done in people. It's already happened. It's, it's already there. So, so that's one thing to see. And then also the eighth thing would be uh, the world economic crisis, which will lead to a one world currency. And, and we're starting to see that the U.S. dollar is, is losing value. The European Union, the euro was making headway. It, it was really increasing like crazy. But then you have people now pulling out of the European Union, which, which their currency will decline also. And, and so ultimately, at the end of the day, all of this has to take place to, to set the stage for a one world leader, a one world currency. And then the ninth thing, the continuing problems of plagues and pestilences. And do we not see that? We see a continual problem with plagues and pestilences, sicknesses and diseases, and, and all these things taking place. And then you, then you read the stories, you know, when you look at the AIDS epidemic and when it started, it, the, the reality is, is that the virus was created. It wasn't just something that somebody, it was created. You, you, then you start to think of things like, wow, you know, you start to see all these different things that are taking place. And just the other day I was reading a young girl, she was 23 years old, a mother of two, died of the flu. How do you die of the flu? Perfectly healthy, got the flu, and then died like three days later. And so it's going to be pestilences and things like that. And, 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 and this is continuing to go on and on. And all these types of diseases and viruses and so many people getting sick. And, and these things will continue to grow. 
and continue to go. And then the increase of lawlessness as it was in the days of Noah. Lawlessness. Do we not see that today? It's becoming normal now for there to be church shootings. It's becoming normal now for there to be school shootings. It's becoming normal now for people to go into a mall or to a grocery store. and just. So when you watch it on the news, it, it, even if it happens in your city, you're just kind of like, oh, wow, at least I wasn't there at that time. You see what I'm saying? It's like it's becoming so normal now where before years ago, we would have been like, how could somebody have done this? But now we're hearing about it all the time, all the time. Lawlessness, lawlessness, shootings everywhere. It doesn't matter where you would always hear of this stuff in other countries. We're hearing of it more and more, even in our own country. And you know what? People are becoming desensitized to this stuff. It's crazy. And then violence increases as it was in the days of Noah. Lawlessness and violence increases. Apostasy, listen to this, in the church. Apostasy in the church. The organized church rejects the historic Christian faith. And we're seeing that. Many people in the body of Christ turning to, you know, a new way of studying the Bible or a new way of looking at the Christian faith or a new way of, uh, of understanding what the scriptures say, things like that, you know. And so all, all these things begin to show this is why we could never leave the simplicity of preaching the gospel. Then we also see, too, the 13th thing is the move toward a one world religion. And ultimately, that's what's going to happen. Once Christianity is gone, it's off the scene, and that can only happen by the rapture of the church. All these, all these religions are going to come and say, we all have one thing in common. You know, we all, we all want this type of common good, so to speak. And, and you start to see that with a lot of these atrocities that are happening around the world, right? You start to see other groups, denominations, faiths, and, and cults even kind of coming together. Where you started to see this at the very start, and it's interesting, remember when, uh, what was it, that Proposition 8, you remember that, about marriage? The biggest proponents and supporters of that were the Mormon church. They're the ones that funded the whole thing to fight against same-sex marriage. But look at every evangelical church that got behind it and supported it and even put their money with the Mormons' money and said, yeah, let's do that. There they were aligning themselves with an occult. You see, it's, it's already started in simple things like, oh, come on, we're going for the same thing. Like, I get all that. All I'm saying is that sets the stage for to make it easier later on down the line. You know, the Christian faith and what we believe is evangelical sets us apart. We preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. The 14th thing is that Israel is abandoned by the world. Anti-Semitism increases. Israel is abandoned by the world. So how many of you guys have heard today in the news that President Donald Trump, God bless his soul, and I thank the Lord for his boldness. In the 90s, our Congress approved that the capital of Israel is Jerusalem. And since then, every sitting president could give a waiver for six months so that he doesn't have to make the decision. I guess from the time that it was approved by Congress, no president wanted to make that move. They didn't want to be the one to be labeled. They didn't know what it would do to this country. They were afraid. They were warned by all other countries, you better not do that. Air, uh, Islamic countries, the Arab world were saying, you better not do that. You better not recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Tel Aviv is the capital. So our U.S. Embassy has been in Tel Aviv for years. It's been in Tel Aviv for years. No country, no country in the world has ever recognized Jerusalem as the capital. None. Ever. And when President Donald Trump made the decision today and declared that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Now remember, he's not talking about all of Jerusalem. He's only talking about Western Jerusalem because Eastern Jerusalem is still under Palestinian control. It's Western Jerusalem. And so he's recognizing Israel, or excuse me, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And what's amazing and remarkable about it, it's monumental. And the Arab world is outraged. Now, it's daytime over there. You know, maybe, you know, I don't know, daytime in Israel. But in our, our daytime when President Trump was giving that announcement, it was nighttime over there. And on the Jaffa Gate, on the wall of the beautiful city of Jerusalem, massive walls, they had these pictures of both American and Israeli flag together. 
shining bright, illuminated, projected onto the wall. And it said December 9th, Israel thanks and applauds American President Trump. Because we are the first country in the history of Israel becoming a nation to recognize Jerusalem as their capital. And just recently, we just seen in the news, now the, um, the Philippines, they're also now um, recognizing Jerusalem uh, as the capital of Israel. When that was set forth, 151 countries opposed it. 151 opposed it. The 14th thing is that no other nations would help Israel. And so we are living in some interesting times. I'm excited to see what God is doing. And um, this, remember what the Lord told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. The United States of America is going to be blessed Thank the Lord for Donald Trump's boldness and his, and his heart to make that step. And I don't care what people say about him and what he does. He's just a crazy dude, man. <laughs> and God put the right man in office. And Romans 13 says that that's the Lord's doing. And, and you know what? I, I don't agree with everything he does and says. You know, at the end of the day, I, I know he's not a born-again Christian. I know that. So that's why you see the things that he says and does. But he's just not afraid of anybody and doesn't care what people think about him. And he just went and did something that no sitting president did. And so I have a few friends that, you know, we're, we're, we're prophecy buffs. So I got a treat for you guys tonight. I contacted a dear friend of mine and I says, hey, I want your thoughts on a couple of things. And he said, what, what, what are your thoughts? I says, well, I want you to explain a couple of things to me. This, this, is what I, this is what I text him. This is what I text him. This was at about 2, almost 3 o'clock today. I said, so what can we expect with Trump's move? Jerusalem recognized by U.S. as capital. Here's his words. Trouble in Gaza for sure. The Gaza Strip, trouble in Gaza for sure. Would not be surprised to see an emboldened Israel take another shot at the Iranians in Syria. The guy to watch right now is the crown prince in Saudi Arabia. He is the voice of the Sunni Islam right now. If he endorses Trump's decision, we can see things get interesting real fast. My word to him was, wow. I put, I think I just read that Bibi, or Benjamin Netanyahu, we call him Bibi, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, stated that he would attack Iran if needed just a couple of days ago. He said, yes, he did told Putin and Assad, the regime there in Syria, he would not stand for an Iranian presence in Syria and would take whatever steps necessary to prevent it, including targeting Iran. Then I put, yeah, that's what I read in, in the Jerusalem Post actually this morning. He says, two attacks in Syria in three days. The IDF is not playing. And then I put, can I share your thoughts with our congregation tonight? He said, absolutely, bro. So he did something even better. He made a special video for our church. He's going to speak to you for the next six minutes, Pastor Barry Stagner. So go ahead and play the clip tonight. Hey, Pastor David and Living Way Church family. Boy, what an exciting day it's been around the world and certainly in our country. As most of you have heard, our president has publicly declared Jerusalem to be the capital city of the nation of Israel. Of course, we already knew that. And God certainly did, said his name would be there perpetually. So, but this is a significant development, and we know that Genesis 12, 3 promises a blessing to those who bless the descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob, that being the nation of Israel. So, great move on our president's part. Now, what would we expect to see from those who don't see it as such a great move? Well, the Palestinians have already threatened three days of rage, seeking to bring about a third intifada. Now, an intifada just means an uprising, and the uprising would be in hopes of uprooting the nation of Israel, the Zionist occupiers as they call them. Yet, Amos 9.18 says, once Israel is back in the land, they will never be uprooted. So we'll have to keep an eye on the Gaza Strip and see what type of de uh, violence develops there and in the West Bank as well. Now we also have some other interesting possibilities. We know that uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has made no bones about the fact to either Vladimir, uh, Vladimir Putin or Bashir al-Assad 
that he will not tolerate a permanent Iranian presence in the nation of Syria, just on Israel's northern border. Thus, we have seen over the past week or so, three days apart, a series of airstrikes by the IAF targeting a base just outside of Damascus. Now, they've called it a scientific research facility, but we know that there were high-ranking military officials there and they were killed in both of these uh, separate strikes. So, could this potentially embolden Israel having the U.S. now publicly coming out and the Philippines president as well has now stated that their country will recognize Jerusalem as the capital of the nation of Israel? But could this potentially embolden Netanyahu to go out and carry, go on and carry out more airstrikes against uh, the Iranian presence in the uh, nation of Syria? So this is a possibility, but there's another thing out there on the horizon I find to be very interesting. Over the past couple of weeks, uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, has come out publicly in an article quoting an Egyptian scholar stating that Jerusalem has no significance to Islam. It's not mentioned in the Quran. Uh, the supposed visit of Mohammed to the Al-Quds Mosque, Al-Quds simply means the faraway mosque that is mentioned in the Quran, couldn't possibly have happened because the Al-Quds Mosque in Jerusalem wasn't there until 100 years after Muhammad was dead. So how could he possibly visit it? As a matter of fact, they go as far to say that Muhammad never left the boundaries of Saudi Arabia in the whole of his lifetime. So therefore, even though they have protested initially the statements of the President of the United States, we do know that they have made overtures toward Israel to bring about a more moderate relationship with them as the Crown Prince has stated that they're looking to present a more moderate face of Islam to the rest of the world, even in 2018, for the first time allowing women to drive in that country. So interesting developments. We could see some aggression on the part of Israel being emboldened by the president's words just today. We could also see a furthering of the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Israel, because we know, interestingly, that this article quotes an Egyptian scholar, because with the nations, that are going to invade Israel that are listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39, the Saudis are absent. They're listed under the names uh, of the descendants of Noah, Sheba, and Dedan. That's a geographic area that represents uh, uh, Saudi Arabia as well as portions uh, of the Arab Peninsula. Now, it's also interesting that even though Egypt has invaded Israel in every war since May 14, 1948, they're also absent in the list of nations that invade Israel. And now we've got these two partnered together to say that Jerusalem has no significance to Islam whatsoever. As a matter of fact, there's a hashtag floating around in Saudi Arabia that says hashtag Riyadh is more important than Jerusalem. And obviously with Mecca and Medina inside the boundaries of Saudi Arabia, uh, it's of great significance to them that all things pertaining to the birthplace of Islam remain inside the borders of Saudi Arabia. So not knowing exactly what's going to develop out of these things, but we can rest assured based on past history that there'll be some form of violence coming out of the Gaza Strip and protest to the president's recognition of Israel having as, as its capital city, the city of Jerusalem. Now, the president also stated that they are still pushing forward on a two-state solution. Now, that portion of his statements today is not good. Uh, Zechariah says that uh, those who seek to divide Israel will be cut in two. We certainly don't want to see that happen. And our diplomatic efforts in that area are going to fall short, to be sure. Uh, we know that uh, Jerusalem will not be divided until during the tribulation. Zechariah 14 says it will happen in that day and God will immediately respond to the invading nation. So what's going on in our world today? Our president of the United States, I believe, has done something that has the potential to bring great, great blessing to the United States, according to Genesis 12, 3. And also we have the potential of an upheaval, uh, uh, intifada in the Gaza Strip and other uh, militant Muslims joining in around the world in that. So keep your eyes and ears open. And we also have the possibility that the Saudi Israel relationship will grow even closer, even though they initially protested their hatred for Shia Islam or the Iranians, as well as other areas, could potentially outweigh any uh, ramifications from having this relationship with Israel. So great time to be alive. Most of all, with all this information happening, the wonderful things we see being fulfilled prophetically, may that stir us all up to tell people about Jesus, the way, truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. So bless you guys as you continue your study in the Olivet Discourse. Excited to hear you in Daniel on Sunday too. What a great time to be alive. God bless you all. And remember, we'll see you either, as they used to say in the Jesus Movement days, we'll see you here, there, or in the air. Our redemption is nigh. God bless you. So 
looking at what he said and the things that we've just been discussing, as I told you guys, we are living in some interesting times. Amen? And all the people that have criticized the faith and have criticized, you know, uh, prophecy, Bible prophecy, it's, it's, this, this is the stuff that, that, that the enemy in no way wants the church to, to believe or to, or to live out, or to know. And, and this is why today so many people are distracted with, with weird stuff. And this is what we're to be looking. We're to be looking at Israel. We're to be looking at what the Bible says. We're to be seeing all the things that, that pertain to the last days. And so with that said, you know, today I was just kind of thinking about that as in preparation for the chapter that we're in. I told him, I says, you know, we're in Matthew 25. He says, man. You're like, you're, he's like, wow. I says, yeah, we're in the book of Daniel. I'll be on Daniel chapter 9 on Sunday morning. And, and then we've been going over these royal psalms. And, the, and he's just like, wow, this happened right at the right time. So it's like everything you're saying is not far-fetched. It's there. We're close. It's on the cuffs of, of where we are in Bible prophecy. So tonight we're going to be looking at verses 14 and on down. And I want to just kind of get, it's a, it's a parable that, that we've heard many times. We'll read through the parable and then we'll highlight and touch on some notes. And it's going to be very consistent. Everything that we've been discussing since the very start of what I've been talking about is very consistent with where we're at. Jesus gives uh, several parables in answering the question to the disciples when he already explained to them that no one knows the day nor the hour. Jesus kind of gives these series of parables. And remember what, what I said, that the believer should be always living this, this, this life of expectation, right? And, and remember, it was Martin Luther who said, believers should live as if Jesus had died this morning, that he was risen from the dead this afternoon, and that he's coming back this evening. Died this morning, raised this afternoon, coming again this evening. The believer is to live his life in constant expectation of the coming of Jesus. Jesus gives these series of parables, and the parables address a couple of things. In other words, the first parable of the parable of the wise and foolish virgins was, were they prepared? Are you ready? And, and preparation. Were they ready? Were they ready? Well, we know that the wise were, but the foolish weren't. And though the wise were there, they were ready, they were able to go in. The foolish, even though they went to go get more oil, were not able to enter in. Jesus gives now this second parable in this series of parables in chapter 25. And he goes on to say in verse 14, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Now let's consider this for a moment because we'll see here that this man will later be called master by these servants. And the man here in verse 1 is no different than uh, the master in the rest of this parable. And the servants are those who the master has appointed and or has entrusted. And notice that here... It's, it's an interesting thing to point out when you look at the word servant here because technically that's all we are. We're just servants. We're servants. We are, we are servants of the Lord. And uh, we see that Paul the Apostle in Romans chapter 1 and verse 1 uh, called himself a servant of the Lord. And Peter in 2 Peter in chapter 1 and verse 1 calls himself a bondservant of the Lord. And, and you know, he, here's the thing with this is that when you consider this, you know, servants in these days... They weren't called servants. They were called slaves. Some translations will say slave. It'll use that terminology and it'll use that word because, you know, and some people have a hard time with that. They have an issue with the word slave. And ultimately, that's what we are. We are slaves of Christ. That's what we are. We're no longer our own. We've been bought at a price. He purchased the price. He, he, he paid the price and purchased us. And we are no longer, that's why Peter says we are no longer our own. And, and, and you know, and then the issue is somebody tries to, uh, you know, will highlight, well, yeah, we're bond servants. So that doesn't make you no difference. Now you're just a purchased slave. That's what you are. Remember very clearly when we see the law that was given for, for the slaves as, as they were purchased, they would work for a period of time, right? And what did the Lord say in the law? He says, listen, you know, every seven years you release a slave. And, and if the slave does not want to go, if the slave doesn't want to leave, what did he say? He says, and you go ahead and you place an awl on his ear. You pierce his ear, right? 
And now that slave goes from being a slave who is now given to you because something's owed to you to a slave now that is, that is, that is freely willing to stay with you. And so they go from, from being a, a purchased slave to now being a slave that stays willfully. And it shows quite a bit about, about who they are. Now, here's the thing. Jesus had already paid the price for everybody. It's just up to the individual if they willful, uh, willingly want to serve Jesus. And you might say, well, then how come we're not pierced? Because Jesus was pierced for us. He was pierced for us. And so here, the servants here that are spoken of here is the word doulos, which, would, which could also be servant or slave, translated in that way. But that is the idea behind it. The, the, the disciples in Jesus' time didn't look at people as specific servants. They, 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 had, they had slaves in that. I mean, think about it. In, in the story of Philemon, remember, uh, you know, this, this amazing story of this runaway slave. Well, <laughs> when Paul was in prison in Rome, at that specific time, there were millions, millions of slaves. And there was, it's believed, several hundred thousand that were runaway slaves. And it's just out of all the midst of all these slaves, Paul runs into a guy by the name of Philemon. Coincidence? No, divine appointment. And then Paul happens to know the people that Philemon stole from. You know, and, and, and so you see this whole entire story of, of Onesimus and Philemon and, 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 and all this stuff going down. Well, this was God's doing. And so this was a common practice, and this is why the terminology to the disciples, they understand what's going on here. Well, they see, okay, so a certain kingdom is like a, like a, a, a man uh, going on a long journey. He, he leaves his own. Notice what it says here, his own, his own servants. These are his. They belong to him. And notice what he's saying here, that that's all they are. You need to be okay with that, that that's all you are. That's all we are. We're just servants of the Lord. And, and notice what he goes on to say here. Well, when you look at this here, uh, and you consider this here, he says in verse 15, and to one he gave five talents. Now, here's what we need to consider. Servants given a talent. Now, there's a lot of, I guess you can say discussion going back and forth as to the exact amount of this talent. Now, here's the thing. Some people think that these are talents, gifts in some way. Well, these talents have monetary value to them. And if you were to take the value of this talent in today's equivalency, uh, economic equivalence, it would probably be, be about, you know, upwards of about, uh, maybe in Jesus' day, 80,000, uh, in, in our day today, 800,000. So the point that's being made is not really how much is it. How much is it? No, the point is that it's a large sum. It's a lot. In other words, it's a lot that they were entrusted with. But the talent is not just money. The talent also, in a sense, yeah, resources, but also resources in the lives of these servants. It could be time. It could also be money. It could be abilities. It could be authority. These are the things that the master gave to the servant or this man traveling to a far country. And it says here that, that he gave, he delivered his goods to them, that which meant something to him, something that was very valuable. And he goes on to say here that it says, here's another thing about these talents. One, well, we know that it was a large sum, so take note of that. And he says that he gave one of them five talents, to another he gave two, and to another he gave one. But look at what else. Here's the second thing. To each according to his own ability. The word ability is the Greek word dunamis, which means power. One's ability. So in other words, whatever one was capable of doing. So God doesn't give you more than, than, than you can not take care of. So sometimes you see people in the kingdom, in the body of Christ. There's some people that are gifted in other areas that you might not be gifted in. And there are people who have wealth and riches in the kingdom, and there are some that don't. But... But to each is given what they have the ability to serve. God gives us these for the purpose of service. Why? Because we are servants. And so the idea here is that they were all given a large sum. Remember, it's not to consider here, okay, what is it? Um, how much is it? No, it's just a large sum. And look who he gave it to. He didn't give it to his assistants in the kingdom. He didn't give it to, you know, the nobles in his kingdom. He gave it to his servants. 
Just consider that for a moment. That's why I kind of laid the whole thing out with the term doulos. It doesn't just mean servant. It also means slave. So would you entrust a slave with a large sum? Probably not. But this man did. And it lays emphasis to what Paul says, that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Well, what's a treasure? It's obviously something that has great value to it. Something that is, means a lot to the Lord God, right? And so he puts his treasure in earthen vessels. Well, we're the earthen vessels. And so the idea here now kind of gives us a better understanding that in a sense, if you were to look at verse 14 and say, well, what is notable about these servants? The only thing is that this man going on a far journey entrusted them with something very valuable. Now what does that do? Well, in a sense, even though they were just servants, it places a different emphasis on them. They are trusted. They are entrusted with something of great value. And so then he gives one uh, five, the other two, one of them one. Now remember, it says according to their ability. You see, God already knows what we're capable of. God knows our abilities and our enablements. And then look at what else it says. And immediately he went out on a journey. In other words, there was, there, there was immediately he went on a journey. And the idea here, journey, is that there was no time given. In other words, he says here, this is what you're entrusted with. And, and, and do what, what one should do with this large sum. And he went on a journey. And in no way did he discuss with them when I'm coming back, the timing of my return. No, he went on a journey. And so we see here in verse 16 that immediately the one who was given five talents went. Notice this. He went. He didn't sit around. He didn't wait a couple of weeks. He didn't wait a couple of days. He immediately went. He went right away. He went and he traded with them and made another five talents. Now think about this. He wasted no time in the talent that was given to him, the talents that he was entrusted with. What did he do? He showed that he truly valued the master's talents that were given to him. He didn't waste no time. He immediately went out. He traded it and gained five more. In other words, he valued what the Lord had given him. And we are to value what the Lord gives us. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. Notice that. Immediately they went out. And they went to work with what they were given. And keep in mind too, guys, you don't see an argument between the two as the one with the two going to the one with the five and saying, well, I wonder why he gave you three more. The issue is not an issue between the two. The whole purpose of the parable and the emphasis of the parable is the value that was entrusted to the servants by their master. And it just goes to show that the master was correct in giving to each one the amount that he gave because he knows his servants. He knew he couldn't give the one that he gave to five. He knew he couldn't do that. The one that he gave two to, he knew that that's all he could use and do. Not because he was ineffective, but that was his ability. Some are called. To win many people to the kingdom. Some might be called just to win one. Some might be called to do great ministerial things for the Lord. And some might not do that great of a thing in the eyes of man. But in the kingdom, in, in, in God's economy and kingdom, there's great value to everything that God entrusts to his servants. And so the picture and the backdrop of all of this really is between the man and these three servants of his. And remember what Jesus says. He says, for the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what it's like. So there's a master and there's servants. The kingdom of heaven has a master and has servants. And the kingdom of heaven has a master who entrusts his servants. And on the outside, people would look and they would say, your servants are not worthy of that. Why are you giving it to them? Look at them. What have they done? No, they haven't done anything. I've done it all. I gave it to them. And I'm going to entrust them with it. And notice that he didn't give them what they could not handle. It was according to their ability. God always gives us what we need to do the work that he's called us to do. Remember that statement as we have here going out on the back side of the church there. That God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. It's his doing. He entrusts. He gives 
what is needed. And then look at what it says. So, so, the, so the one who was given five, he, he doubled it. He has ten now. And the one that was given two, he doubled it. He has four now. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. So see, now the man is called the Lord. And then later on, we'll see that he's recognized as the master. Now look at what it goes on to say here. So it says now, the difference now between the three servants is the one that was given five, according to his ability, he doubled it. The one that was given two, according to his ability, he doubled it. Well, that would mean this. Listen, the one who was given one, he was given according to his ability. But notice something. Did God get his ability wrong? If the other two doubled theirs and the one who was given one, rather than going out immediately and, double, and doubling it, what he did was he went and he dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. He hid it. After a long time, in other words, there's no timing in the Lord's return. But the man, the Lord here, delays in his return. It says the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Jesus will come at his second coming, and Jesus, when he returns, he will judge. For the believer, guys, listen, there's going to be a day where even Christians will be judged. You know that, right? Romans chapter 14, in verse 10, the Bible says, we will go before what is known as the Bema Seat of Christ. The believer will be judged for their works. Has nothing to do with us making heaven our home. That was already paid for at the cross. But remember, it kind of goes into what Paul says in 1 Corinthians in chapter 3 when he says, be careful as to how you build on this foundation. Jesus is the foundation, but be careful how you build on it. Whether by, you know, wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stones, he says, it will be revealed by fire as to what sort of work it was on that day. And some will be saved just by fire. You see, the believer will also be judged for, in other words, their talent and their abilities that God has given them. Do we value the abilities and talents that God has given us? Do we place a high emphasis on the, the liberties and the power that we have to proclaim and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to do the work that God's called us to do? This is kind of the whole idea behind this parable. Remember, the first was, are you prepared the second is, are you busy? Will you be found busy about your father's business when he comes back? Will you be a doer? Will you be one who is constantly, I'm not talking about getting caught up in juggling 10 different ministries. That's not what this parable is speaking about. Let me give you an idea just so you can have a better understanding. The parable proposes one thing and one thing only. It's not the amount of ministries you can juggle until the Lord comes back. It's the way you do ministry. You see, the one that doubled, well, the both that doubled, the five and the two, when they doubled it, it went to show that they truly valued what the Lord entrusted them with. They valued what their Lord gave them, implying what? That immediately, it says, they went to go work. In other words, immediately they went to obey. Obedience is a key here. They were obedient. Now, you might say, well, I value what the Lord, you know, has given me. I mean, look at everything that I'm doing. But listen, if you're not living a holy life and honoring the Lord, if you're, if you're practicing sin, you don't value what God has given you at all. You're not valuing it. You see, there's no compromise. These did not compromise. They went and they just did. They didn't have to be prepped and primed. They didn't have to be patted on the back. They knew exactly what to do. And they knew the price that would be paid on their part to do it. They knew that there was no time to mess around. They knew there was no time to treat the very valuable talents that the Lord had given them lightly and in any way to try to mess around with it or see how far they can push the envelope. No, they immediately went and what happened? They produced fruit and that fruit remained. It doubled. God always pays high dividends to obedience and holiness. But look at what it says in verse 20. So he who had received five talents, came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, listen to this. I have gained five more talents besides them. In other words, guys, listen, faithfulness pays off. Faithfulness pays off. 
And look at what the Lord says to him. I love this because there's, there's more than one reward in just what Jesus gives here. There's actually three. I want you to jot these down. But look at what he says here. He says, I've gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, listen to this. Well done, good and faithful servant. There's the first, re there's the first reward right there. The Lord praised him for what he did. Well done. It was praised filled. Imagine hearing those words. Don't we always say that? We want to hear the words, well done. And that was the first thing that came out of the Lord's mouth. Well done. And then he says, good and faithful servant. Notice that. Good and faithful servant. You were faithful, faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. There's the second reward. I will make you ruler over many things. God pays high dividends for faithfulness and he will give you more responsibility and more talents to use for his kingdom. He's faithful in doing that. He blesses it. And notice there, the second reward, he says, I will make you ruler over many things. What's the third reward? Enter into the joy of your Lord. Enter into the joy of your Lord. There it is. There's the third reward. And it's the best of the three. Entering into the joy of the Lord. Think about that for a moment there. Think about that. He praises. It's, 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 a, it's a praised feel, filled you know, encouragement. Well done. And then more responsibility is given to him. And this is what the Lord does. When we, when we deal faithfully with what God has given us, our time, our talents, our abilities, our resources, when we're good stewards, and we do what God's called us to do, stewardship above reproach, honoring the Lord, living in holiness, and serving the Lord. Listen, God pays high dividends for these things. Jesus will come to settle accounts not only with the wicked and judge them, but he will come settle accounts with the church. That's why Peter says judgment begins in the house of God. It starts with us first. And so we see here in that way, listen guys, this is not a judgment into eternity. This is a judgment of how we are living it out now and presently. And, and I'm blown away to see Christians that, or people that profess to be Christians and say that, you know, their Christian life is not fulfilled, as if they got to be doing something in order to be fulfilled. I'm just happy that I'm born again and my name's been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If anything, I don't got to be doing anything. I never asked to be a pastor. I never prayed like, God, I want to be a pastor or I want to be a teacher in the church. I never asked for any of this. So at the end of the day, what God has done, he's just done all this on his own. He's worked all this out. I just sit back and I'm just like, okay, Lord, if this is the direction you want me to go, I'll go. If this is the direction you want me to go, I'll go. If this is what you don't want me to do, I won't do. I'll, whatever you want me to do. If you just want me to sit and be quiet, I'll sit and be quiet. At the end of the day, if all Jesus came to do in my life personally is forgive me of my sins, he's done enough. I don't need anything else. My sins are forgiven and my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. But knowing that you are right with the Lord God because of what Jesus did, that should motivate you more than anything. It's like, it's like sometimes people get their, their second wind or their burst of energy when something good happens to them. That's not Christianity. That's not the God of the Bible. That's not the Jesus of the New Testament. What you're like, or you're like those multitudes that followed him just to get a free meal. That's what you're like if that's you. What we need to be like is Peter, when Jesus said, look at all these disciples have left me, John chapter 6 and verse 66. Yeah, I said it's 666. But the Bible says what? That many departed from him, and Jesus looked to the disciples, and he says, are you going to go too? And Peter says, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. You just need to be happy that Jesus has the words of life. You just need to be happy that you're just a servant, and that's it. That's it. And remember, the talent never belonged to the servants. It always belonged to the master. It always belonged to their Lord. He just entrusted them. Now look at what else we see here. He goes on to say this. He says, well done and good and faithful servant. And he says, you are faithful in a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord... You delivered to me two talents. Look, 
I have gained two more talents besides them. Same thing. He, he doubled his. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Think about this for a moment here. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Once again, we see the first is praise filled, you know, well done. And then the second, uh, that is, you know, saying, hey, listen, um, you have done this and um, you have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. You blessed him with more. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. But then comes the third servant that's different than the two in that. He says, then he who has received one talent came and said, listen to this, Lord, I knew you. I want you to stop right there. Lord, I knew you. That's a lie. He didn't know the Lord. He says, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. In other words, he didn't look to the Lord in a way worthy of the gift given to him. Notice that. In other words, he's saying, look at the reason why I'm about to explain to you why I only have what I have is notice what he did. He presented already an excuse. He's presented an excuse and, and notice what his excuse is. You see what he's doing? He's blaming the Lord for what he believes him to be. You're a hard man, he says. He says, you're, you're a hard man reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed, and I was afraid. So you're the reason why I didn't produce fruit. You're the reason why I'm in the situation that I'm in now. God, you're to blame. Kind of reminds me, of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 12, when Adam said, it's the woman you gave me. I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is, listen to this, what is yours. He lacked faith and didn't trust in the master. He also wasn't waiting for the Lord's return. He wasn't anticipating a return from the Lord. So what is this third servant like? Well, basically, what did he do when he hid the talent? He wasn't living for his master. The talent was buried. So in other words, he had no responsibility to the master. You know what he did? He lived his own life for himself rather than the life the Lord had offered him. And he hid this talent in the ground. He didn't do anything with it. And notice the Lord's response. Total opposite of the three rewards that are stated in the first two. But notice the total opposite here is, but his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. Oh, this is far different from well done, good and faithful servant. You see, so when you see that here, now he points to his laziness. In other words, this is a sin of omission, right? Commission is different. Obviously, he could have did something in this way, what he did was he left this out. He left out the most important thing and then tried to turn it and blame it onto the Lord. It doesn't work that way. You can't blame other people for where you are today in Christ. You can't say it was your spouse's fault or a co-worker's fault or a loved one got you upset and that's why I'm not the Christian that I... You cannot blame somebody for your lack of faith. Listen, nobody died for you other than Jesus himself. You can't blame people. For your inconsistency. And even though you try, you're like this servant here that is unfaithful and really is a lazy servant. And look at what he said. He's actually using his own words out of his mouth to judge him. The Proverbs say that we're snared by the words of our mouth. He says, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew what I you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. In other words, you should have gave it to somebody else. You should have let somebody else think about it. 
They could have did something with it. You didn't do anything with it. You didn't do anything with what I entrusted you with. It showed that he, had, he didn't care for the value. And, and, and so when you think of this, you kind of consider this for a moment. In Matthew chapter 7, this is the individual that says, Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, Jesus says, not all who call upon my name, Lord, Lord. He's talking about the church, guys. He's talking about people here in the body of Christ. He's, let's put it this way. He's talking about Living Way Christian Fellowship tonight for midweek Bible study. There are people that attend this church that I know for a fact, because the scriptures clearly teach it, though I, I, I believe in great faith, and, and, and in the years that this ministry has been in existence, I can tell you right now, I know that there will be people that have come and gone through these doors that will not make heaven their home. There's no doubt in my mind. And there are some that have come in and through these doors that are those of Matthew chapter 7. And Jesus said, in that day, they're going to come and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, have we not done this? This is why he says, not everybody who calls me Lord. But he says this, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Those are the ones. What is the will of the Father? You know, you know what it is? It's very simple. I'll read it to you. It's, I mean, the Bible gives it, lays it out very clearly to you and I. I'll read it to you right now. You ready for this? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I don't know how many times I've got to read it to you, but listen to what it says here. Listen. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12, We urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Part of the will of God is to respect the order of the church, leaders, and those that are overseers. People that come into the church and don't respect the leaders and the order of service. and the Listen, those are people that are just here to cause a problem. They have no desire to do the will of God. Right? Nobody gave the ministry. God didn't give the ministry of fruit inspector to anybody, okay? Think about that for a moment. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. That's part of the will of God. And so many people want to know what's the will of God for my life. Why don't you just focus on respecting the people that God put you under. And two, be at peace with everybody. How many of you guys know that those two things are the hardest things to do? Yes or no? Oh, but everybody wants to, you know, lead something and do some great things and conquer the world and win it for Jesus. But you can't even be at peace among yourselves. Look at what else it says in verse 14. It says, now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. Think about this here. Warning those who are unruly, well, you know, insubordinate or idle. Comfort the faint-hearted. There's going to be insubordinate people. And people that are just agitated with, with, within the fellowship. Listen, the Bible is saying care for one another. This is what it's saying. The part of the will of God is caring for one another. Comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always, not sometimes, always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Do we always rejoice? Didn't think so. Pray without ceasing. In everything, not in some things, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Well, I want to know what God's will is for my life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting in verse 12, all the way to verse 18. That's the will of God. Start there. And everything else follows and flows from there. Not all who call upon my name, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of God, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And then Jesus goes on to say, and in that day many will come to me and say, Lord, have we now prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And on that day I'll declare to them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Notice Jesus doesn't deny the claims that they're making, prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name. The emphasis and point that Jesus is making is that in the midst of the work and ministry of the church where the Spirit is at work, there are going to be people that don't even know the Lord. And I say all this because I believe this is a stage that Jesus is setting in this parable with this one servant. And so the point that's being made tonight, guys, listen, do we value what the Lord has entrusted? Do you value that? or do you, what, what are the things you value in life tonight? 
Do you value getting your point across? Do you value uh, being the most important person in the room? Do you value your family or your resources or your job more than what God's entrusted you with? Your family didn't die for you. Your kids didn't die for you. Jesus did. Your spouse didn't die for you. Jesus did. And you have eternal life because of what Jesus did, not with your family or work or resources or anything. Done. You have eternal life because of Jesus. Not for nothing else but Jesus. That's it. And if we focus back on Jesus, we'll never commit the issues or the things that here this unprofitable, this lazy servant did. God hates laziness. Read it in the scriptures. It's sinful to him. It's a sin for us to practice. And let me tell you something. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, the lazy servant is kind of pictured there with the person who treats the precious things of the Lord as something common. We're not to do that. We're not to do that at all. And then he goes on to say this in verse 29, or excuse me, verse 28. Therefore take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given and he will have an abundance, but from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Now I want to kind of give you guys this idea here, if you can, jot these down as we wrap this up tonight. First thing we see with the, how we could say, opposite of wards, uh, rewards that are given to this third servant is one, there's no praise. There's a rebuke. There's a rebuke. Second thing was he says, listen, you're lazy. There was no further work entrusted to him and his talent that he had was taken and given to another. Notice that. And then the third thing we see here is in verse 30 it says, and cast the unprofitable, meaning worthless servant, into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The third thing was there was no joy in the presence of the master. No joy in the presence of the master. You see, guys, we need to be faithful with what the Lord has entrusted us. Your question tonight shouldn't be, you know, Lord, I just want to do your will. Help me with this. No, your question tonight should be, Lord, do I value the gospel? Do I value what you've done for me? Some would say, well, I can value it if this didn't happen or that didn't happen. Speaking with a gentleman today about his ministry as we were talking, and he just began to share some things with me, and he went through just great hardship in his ministry. I mean, really, really hard. And he was explaining to me, um, you know, the temptation of walking away and just, and just going, and I'm telling him, you know, in this, as we're talking, I says, you, you, you know, you know what you're capable of doing. You know what you could go back and do. And he says, yes. And I says, but we're not, you know, we, we don't do that. You know, we, we, we stick it out. We tough it out, bro, you know, kind of thing. And we, 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 we hang in there. And, and I says, and you know what? Probably everybody's told you, man, you probably should have just walked away. And he says, you know what? People were calling me and telling me that. He says, people were calling me and telling me, and he goes, you're the first one that's called me today and told me after I told you everything, you're the first one that's called me and said, man, thank God, bro, that you stuck it out. He goes, I had every excuse just to walk away and leave it all. He says, but, but, but you want to know what? He says, I, I, it's, it's, it's worth too much to me. And I said, what is worth too much? He says, what God's done for me. And, and, and I, I was so encouraged by that. You know, as I was, you know, preparing for the study, you know, and, 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 I, and I says, let's pray right now. So we, we prayed for a little while and, and prayed for one another and each other's ministries. And, and, and you know, th these are constant things on a daily basis, conversations that, that, I, that, I, that, that I get. And I says, you know, and one of the things he said this, he says, you know, before I would have freaked out, I would have freaked out and I would have, uh, you know, uh, did all kinds of crazy stuff and did all this and that. He says, but I realize God's teaching me something in all this. And I said, wow. I know a lot of people that would have walked away already. You mean to tell me like you're welcome? He says, I'm welcoming this. He goes, because there's more I have to surrender to the Lord. I said, what, what did you say again? He goes, there's more I have to surrender to the Lord. I said, wow. I says, bro, I got to read something to you. He says, what? I go, just this. Surrender your whole being to him to be used for righteous purposes. Romans chapter 6 verse 13. This was text to me today. 
What area in your life are you holding back from God? Think about that. And I says, you know what? Check this out, man. I, I got this earlier today and I was sitting in a meeting earlier and this kind of came through. But but I don't know. Maybe it was for those in the meeting or maybe it's for you. And it's absolutely for me. But I says, God allows us to go through things so that we can turn more over to him. And you might say, what is it of value that the Lord has given me? When in reality, we're very valuable to the Lord because he's given all for us. And he says, and cast the unprofitable servant into utter darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I like this here because hellfire is not in view. You know what's in view here? You know what's worse than hellfire? What's in view here? Eternal separation from the Lord. That's worse than hellfire. Eternal separation from the Lord. And so with everything that's going on today, <laughs> and everything in the world around us in the news, I know I've taken a little bit more time, but who cares? We value the Word of God. I can get away with that tonight. But think about it, guys. Think about it. We are living in some interesting times. What type of servant are we? Do we value what the Lord has entrusted us with? Are we going and are we preaching the gospel? Are we sharing the word of God? Or, or, or are we giving excuses to the Lord? Well, God, you, you allowed me to go through this trial, so that's why I'm not doing what I used to do before. Don't be the servant with the one talent who wasn't a servant at all. Jesus said he was worthless. Don't be what the enemy calls you. Be what God has made you. The enemy calls you worthless. God calls you his son and his daughter. All for the purpose of what the Lord provided the means for you to be right with him. Nothing you do. It's all on his part. Yeah.